Hi, welcome to Get Used to It. I'm Sheila Kuehl, and as always, I will guide us through this wonderful hour of conversation. Uh, every so often on Get Used to It, we do one of a series we called Voices of Our Lives. And today, my guest is Stuart Beagle, professor of law and professor of education at UCLA, and one of our national experts on an issue that's on everybody's mind these days, and that is about our ability to be out at school and how we protect our kids and our teachers and our staff in the LGBT community at the schools. Welcome, Stuart. Hi, Sheila. Glad you're here. Good to be here. So um, people are always a little curious about who people are when they're doing sort of doing this work. Um, so let's, if we may, start with just a little bio on you. Where did you grow up? I grew up in LA, but I was born in New York and um, spent a lot of summers in New York growing up after we moved here. And so uh, do you still think of yourself as a New Yorker? In some ways, but more of a San Franciscan than anything else at this point. And how did you get out to California? Well, when I was six, my father, um, uh, who had been in the Marines and stationed in California for part of the time, uh, was told my mother that uh, he wanted to move to LA and my mother didn't want to leave her family and the marriage almost broke up as a result. But, oh. um, I think had that happened uh, 20 or 30 years later, that marriage would have broken up and my sister would have never been born. Huh. But, but, but your have, mother would, acquiesced. Yeah, I would have been a New Yorker surely in that <laughs> situation. Um, uh, that's a familiar history to me, I'll tell you, because my uh, when my folks moved here from Missouri, my mom didn't want to move either. Mm -hmm. But when she saw the sunshine in the middle of a snowy season, um, she was a little more relaxed about it. Uh, the weather certainly was a draw. <laughs> Although I enjoyed those, that's the snowstorms when I was a little boy. You know, never feel cold when you're a little boy. That's true. Well, I, I guess if they put all those wonderful snowsuits on you or whatever. Right, right. Bundled. I have pictures of myself bundled up with layers and layers of scarves and hats. So um, what was your history here that led you to think about going to law school? So I actually um, entered UCLA when I was 16. It was not my choice to be that young, but I had skipped the second grade and started school early and they never gave me that option. So mm. I really wasn't ready for college. I, I actually uh, left after two years and spent uh, half a year in New York, um, trying to get a very bad novel published. That <laughs> Wait, I wrote you were 18 and you were trying to get a very bad novel yes, published? Well, I, that's pretty uh, outstanding. Well, it was a terrible novel <laughs> and I don't have it anymore. But I don't have that novel anymore. It was called Not For, Not For That Hour. And it was about a young man coming to a fictional school, very much like UCLA from a small town in Minnesota. And uh, very, very cliche, cliche-ish. Uh -huh. And of course, no one wanted to publish it. And well, I mean, but think of the audacity of an 18-year-old writing a novel. I mean, really. Uh, it's, a, it's a nice way to view it in retrospect at the time. <laughs> no one complimented me. So having uh, not succeeded at that, did you come back to, uh, Came back back to, to school? Came back to school and majored in English. And then I graduated and I had to do something. Um, actually enrolled in our teacher education program and um, at UCLA. At UCLA, uh -huh. the same program that I ended up dropping out of, uh, and the same program that I ended up uh, uh, being in charge of. This is very. Uh, I actually. So you dropped out, but then later you were in charge of it. Oh, the same program that I dropped out. Of, well, that's sort of inspiring to uh, all the dropouts watching <laughs> the show, I guess, huh? Well, uh, I actually, you could say that I dropped out. Uh, uh, three times because I, I I left UCLA after two years. I wasn't sure I ever wanted to come back. Mm -hmm. When I came back, then I entered the teacher education program, and after a month and a half, was sure that it wasn't for me. Mm -hmm. And then when I finally came back after seeing what else was out there uh, for English majors uh, with BAs and <laughs> other girls, um, plus I enjoy working with young people. Um, I was placed in a terrible internship situation in a school where the principal and faculty were not getting along. And I just finally said, what am I wasting my time? I'm, this is not working out for me. And um, 
And it turned out that I, I wasn't, uh, that I had mono on top of everything else because mm -hmm. I was burning the candle at both, at both ends. Mm -hmm. And so I told the, the, the coordinator, I said, you know, I just, I'm not cut out to be a teacher. Mm -hmm. And she said, you've got six weeks to go. I can place you in a very supportive setting. I don't care what you do after this, but just get your credential. Mm -hmm. It was good advice. Because at least having the credential gave you some options. Right. And, and I did become a teacher in LA Unified and then in private school. And then through that met, uh, when I finished law school, met the uh, head of teacher education who, whose daughter was in my class. Mm -hmm. She recruited me to come to UCLA. And, and there I developed a second specialty in law and education. And so had I not stayed in teaching, who knows where the trajectory would have gone. It seems like a, an unusual specialty, though. I mean, uh, there, I know you wouldn't be the only person in the United States, but still, the I don't think people really understand the connection uh, between law and education. Well, for me, it was a way to combine my um, experiences in education and my position in the education school with my legal training. Mm -hmm. But uh, so it, it fit for me very well. But also the fact that so much of what happens in education is driven by the law today or um, collides with the law. Mm -hmm. And the increase in litigation, the increase in education related legislation, there's so much, so much uh, in areas ranging from campus safety to religion to equal opportunity, no child left behind. Um, LGBT issues across the spectrum, mm -hmm. uh, gender equity, disability rights, bilingual education, just uh, it's an amazingly wide ranging and um, uh, um, uh, exciting field. Well, it seemed to me when I was in the legislature that it was the area that sort of captured everybody's, um, I wouldn't say imagination, but it was more like uh, everybody wanted to affect education. Mm -hmm. it, it, was, uh, it was a feeling that of all of the areas that in which we could legislate, there was something everybody wanted to have a, a piece of it. Why do you think that is? Well, you know, education, uh, more than most other things, uh, shapes our future. Uh, and so that's, uh, I think that's a key aspect of it. Also, everybody thinks they're there are experts in the field, which is not always good, as you know. Right. I went to school, therefore I'm an expert. Right. Or I was a parent, or I'm a parent, therefore I'm an expert, even though many parents, of course, are not expert at all. <laughs> <laughs> no, because the qualifications aren't real high. To, right. Uh, you don't have to pass a test. Right. To exactly. Done. Well, um, two things, if I could go back a little bit in history. What, what was it that made you want to go to law school? So... When I was in the ninth grade, I had we had to do two career reports, pick two careers. Uh -huh. And um, interestingly, I chose teaching and law. Uh -huh. uh, but I was always interested in legal issues. And um, even though I was an English major, um, there was a lot of conversation in our family and among my friends about issues. We always watched Perry Mason and reruns, for example, and, and loved them and talked about them and uh, fascinated by legal developments uh, nationwide and worldwide. So, uh, but the specific motivation for law school was that I was very interested in land and wanted to be a real estate lawyer. I laughed because <laughs> I lost that vision along the way. I used to go hiking a lot with my friends in the Santa Monica's and in Northern California in the Redwoods. And one Sunday afternoon in Santa Cruz, looking out at the redwoods and these beautiful ferns and creeks that, you know, I really love land. Maybe I could work on something having to do with land. So we had, um, we got together after the hike for a beer and an early dinner and just reflecting, well, how could I do that? Well, maybe I could be a real estate lawyer. It's kind of a funny. Well, it is funny, but I'm not going to make fun of it because the thoughts that we have along the way in our lives mm -hmm. that get us to do things are often silly in retrospect, mm -hmm. you know, like how could I have ever thought that I would do that? But it seems to have led you in a, a direction that's worked out very well, mm -hmm. certainly for us to have you in those positions. Oh, thank you. Well, but the other question then really goes to sexual orientation. Um, I, I think we both uh, 
had the conversation about, let's see, shall I call it a, being a late bloomer? I'm yes. not quite sure. But um, when did you have a suspicion that you might uh, be a gay man or a gay young man? When I was a little boy. Really? I mean, I can remember feelings back when I was five or younger. Uh huh. But of course. You don't do anything at that point. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe you do, but <laughs> you don't know what you're doing. Right, right. Uh, I did have some mischievous friends, uh, but um, I, I've only been out since uh, late 02, early 03, so definitely a late bloomer. And some people at that point, of course, never break through. But you had, it was interesting when you were talking about your book to me uh, earlier, your, the, the failed novel, the terrible, cliched novel. There was some aspect in that, right? About, uh, or at least a character? There was a gay character, and the main character uh, who roomed with the gay character actually experimented uh, with gay sex with, with, with the gay character and decided he didn't like it. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but he did experiment with it. Mm -hmm. and, as I was at the time as a teenager without, you know, ever acknowledging that that was, you know, that, that I was gay. And did you um, have experiences in school like uh, young people are having now in terms of uh, harassment and, um, you know, um, just problems with other students? Oh, absolutely. You know, I was younger than everybody. Mm -hmm. It was all skinny braces and glasses, although I got to be a pretty good basketball player. Uh -huh. um, mostly after high school, my friends and I used to take on other folks and playground basketball in the area. But um, there's no question that um, that I was uh, a victim of bullying, and people used to make fun of me for throwing like a girl and running like a girl. I, mm -hmm. I never tried to throw like a girl or run like a girl. And my father was a platoon sergeant in the Marines and, mm. a, and a very good athlete. And he tried to teach me how to throw and run. So my role model was a very straight, um, uh, macho type a alpha man. And, and yet I threw like a girl and ran like a girl. Mm -hmm. So they made fun of me. But at times I joined in making fun of others so that they wouldn't make fun of me. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if I was more bullied than participating in. I was probably more bullied than, than participating. But you in. did participate too. We've heard this from other students too. Yes, it's kind of, of like to protect yourself, you, you, you know, you might join in. Mm -hmm. So um, it became, though, an aspect of your teaching, right? I mean, there wasn't a lot of scholarship about LGBT issues, but it seems as though there, be, there came to be an interest about it a little bit in schools. Once I, um, once I came out, um, I got involved with the Williams Institute at UCLA right away. You should probably say what that is for our uh, viewers. The Williams Institute is probably the only think tank of its kind nationwide that focuses on legal issues in the area of sexual orientation and gender identity. Mm -hmm. And they do amazing work. It has grown enormously in the 10 years it's been in existence. And uh, when I came out, to, <clears throat> when I came out to the director, Brad Sears, he put me on the faculty advisory committee right away. He wouldn't take no for an answer because uh -huh. uh, I was already established as uh, uh, as um, someone with expertise in education law at the time, and um, so many of the legal issues having to do with LGBTs are, of course, education related. Uh, so uh, I got involved with them. And I immediately started thinking about a law review article um, that I could write in this area. I also started including the issues in all my education law classes. Not before you came out, but after you came out? I wouldn't go near the issues uh, before, you came before out. I came out. And uh -huh. occasionally they would come up in passing, but um, I don't even think I assigned more than a handful of pages. Mm in any given course. Kind of because of, of being afraid of being found out, maybe? Uh, well, you know, I wasn't even out to myself. Ah. So it, but, you know, so it was less of a fear than it was. I didn't want people to think I was gay. Yeah. The same reason I never wore pink 
or uh, other things uh, that I wear now. <laughs> that you're braver about now. Uh, Nothing like I, honesty, right? Well, after I came out, I started accessorizing all over the place. <laughs> I'm down to one silver ring, but I had multiple silver rings on, on fingers of both hands. I was wearing bracelets and pink necklaces. You should see me. <laughs> I, I was teaching my law school classes and people, you know, they allowed me to teach. With the, the nothing, I'm saying nothing like freedom. It's really yeah, interesting. Yeah. Well, uh, I want to talk a little bit about the area of education and law, sort of in the broader context before mm -hmm. we get to the LGBT mm -hmm. context, because that's a fairly new area, mm -hmm. I think, in this, uh, you know, in comparison. Uh, but you had quite an experience uh, a short time ago um, as I recall, you were on a panel with some of the uh, some of the plaintiffs from some of the famous sort of school cases, uh, which I find that fascinating. Can you, will you tell us a little bit about education and law and that kind of stuff and what that panel was like? So this panel was uh, organized by one of uh, the three major plaintiffs in the school student freedom of speech cases at the K-12 level, Matthew Fraser. There were three major uh, Supreme Court cases dealing with student First Amendment rights. Mm -hmm. And one was the Tinker case brought by John Tinker, uh, who are a black armband to school in Iowa protesting the Vietnam War. Oh, yeah. Uh, then Matt Fraser gave a um, uh, arguably inappropriate and sexually suggestive nominating speech. Uh, at a high school student government assembly in Washington state. And then uh, Joe Frederick, in the case that's become to be known as the Bong Hits for Jesus case, <laughs> held up a sign uh, outside his high school in, in Juneau, Alaska, when the Olympic torch relay came by, ostensibly just to get on TV, which he did. And the principal demanded that he take the sign down. Other friends who were holding it uh, decided to listen to her. He defied her. He had an ongoing battle with administration anyway, and uh, he was punished. So all those cases went all the way to the United States Supreme Court, and I've been teaching about them as they've emerged. Uh, and then I got to be on a panel with all three of the, the men who brought these lawsuits. John Tinker, who's now in his 60s, Hmm. Uh, Matt Fraser uh, in his 40s and Joe Frederick in his 20s. That was just this past summer at Stanford Law School. That must have been fun. It was great. And they but, were very happy to see me. Too. Well, people, I, I want to get back to that, too, mm -hmm. because of your reputation. But people don't really understand what it's like to be a plaintiff in a case. I mean, mm -hmm. you you hear Brown versus Board of Education, everybody says. But who was Brown? You know, I mean, right. in everybody's mind, they would say, I have no idea. And, you know, Tinker versus Des Moines. It was Des Moines, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so there, there's a real person uh, behind right. all these cases. So one kind of case uh, relates to the ability of students to have free speech in schools. But it's not the same as yours and mine on the outside, mm -hmm. right? It's a more limited notion. It seems like education and law is very much like prison and law in a way. What they can tell you that you can't do. Um, uh, I think that that is a very interesting parallel, um, and, and I think it works in, in uh, freedom of expression. With religion, it's a little trickier, the religious aspect and the interplay with uh, the equal opportunity issues with the, the different civil rights movements from, from uh, the African-American civil rights movement to the Chicano rights movement to the push for greater equality among uh, Asian and Pacific Islander mm -hmm. communities to disability rights, to women's rights, LGBT rights. Um, there are parallels, but of course there, there are differences as well. What are some of the religious issues within schools? So uh, it's interesting. I, I was talking to some of the folks here before um, we started the program today. Uh, I just happened to be teaching class at the, my class at the law school on some of the religious issues oh today. yeah and um, uh, we have two religion clauses of course the what's called the establishment clause and what's called the free exercise clause the bill of rights begins with religion mm -hmm. uh, some say it's a coincidence 
Some say it's not. But the Establishment Clause, of course, um, prohibits the establishing of religion, essentially, in the by, public By a government. By a, in the public sector, by right. a government or by um, a public educational institution, which is seen as an arm of the government. Mm -hmm. And free exercise is a more of an individual right to practice uh, your religion or not. So in the school setting, it would be a question of whether the school is creating an atmosphere where a, a religion is established, even though that is not, like you all have to be Episcopalian. Right. But the free exercise would be more what students can say, what teachers can say on campus, off campus. I mean, I think there's been quite a range. Quite a range. Most, most of the disputes in the area of religion in the schools implicate the Establishment Clause. Mm -hmm. there, there are so many of them. And they also, they cover everything from um, uh, displays to uh, uh, programs that are put on by teachers or the student council uh, to uh, public money for private religious education, disputes over funding mm -hmm. um, on those fronts. But there well. must be some in the free speech area now um, because students, primarily Christian students, would say that it was their free speech right to say God hates fags, for instance, please excuse the language. Um, and whereas gay students would say they, you know, that they can't do that. Must be an interesting conflict. There certainly uh, have been some major controversies over t-shirts uh, in the last 10 years. So. What t-shirts students can wear or, or be told not to wear? Right. Right. There, there are, in my book, which I know we're going to get much more into in, in a few minutes, I, I talk about four major um, t-shirt cases. Actually, one of them is not LGBT related, but it's religious. It's religious in nature. It's a, a student in Ohio who used to wear almost, uh, used to wear Marilyn Manson t-shirts, hmm. different store-bought shirts of different types. He loved, apparently he loved Marilyn Manson every day, a different shirt. Hmm. One of the shirts was arguably very offensive to religious students. It, it showed a, a, a picture of a three-headed Jesus pointing in three different directions. And the caption was, see no evil, hear no evil, speak no evil. And then on the back had the word believe with the letters L-I-E hmm. uh, bolded. And the school administration, um, not right away, but when he kept wearing it, they asked him, to, they told him he could no longer wear it because it was inappropriate and, um, uh, and arguably uh, offensive to, to, to many in the school community. And uh, so um, he lost that case mm. uh, two to one in the uh, Court of Appeals uh, in Ohio. Uh, but then there are three t-shirt cases uh, involving t-shirts that were arguably offensive to LGBT students and members of the community. So, um, and they went in different directions. One was a, a sweatshirt in Minnesota that a student wore uh, that said straight pride. Hmm. And on the back had a picture of a, a, a boy and a girl or a man and a woman holding hands. And uh, he, it was a it was a homemade shirt, t -sh sweatshirt. He had a mm -hmm. sweatshirt, and he drew on it, unlike the Marilyn Manson shirt, which was store bought. Uh -huh. And uh, he did it in response to a d debate during uh, the students' uh, high school Christian club over what Jesus's reaction, what Jesus would say about homosexuality. It was a very interesting debate. Mm -hmm. And some students said, of course, he would condemn it, and other students said. Um, no, he wouldn't necessarily condemn it. So one of the students who was sure that Jesus would condemn it was then motivated to create the straight pride shirt and wear it around campus. The principal asked him not to, thought it would be inflammatory. Mm. He went ahead and challenged it in court and he won. So he won. So is that the standard really for free speech of that kind for students? Uh, about whether it would be inflammatory? Well, that's one of the things that, that comes up at the school side level. The, the courts don't typically use that word, interestingly enough. They, they go more toward 
uh, the free speech tests that have been developed in cases such as Tinker that we talked about, mm -hmm. um, whether it's disruptive mm -hmm. or has the likelihood of being disruptive or whether it would interfere with the rights of others. So there was a shirt in the San Diego suburban area, Poway Unified, mm -hmm. uh, where a young man wore a, a version of a homemade shirt which on two different days, which said homosexuality is shameful mm. and cited to uh, Paul's letter in Romans. And then on the, back, on the other side, I forget whether it was front or back, um, he said, I will not accept what God has condemned uh, and then be ashamed the school has accepted what God has condemned, referring to a day of silence demonstration mm -hmm. um, organized by students that the school allowed. That shirt lost. Hmm. Uh, even though he argued, you know, both free speech and religious freedom, because he sincerely believed in that, um, the court, the federal courts at every level uh, over a, f a five or six year period, uh, nobody ruled in his favor. Because it was disruptive or potentially disruptive? Well, interestingly, uh, uh, an opinion by Judge uh, Stephen Reinhardt in the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, uh, uh, one of the most amazing uh, federal judges, as you know, in this country uh, for a long time, uh, uh, he ruled that it interfered, and it was a, a two to one panel, uh, so he was in the majority, that the t shirt uh, interfered with the rights of others. And uh, so the argument being that, uh, that if an LGBT student or, or, or maybe even someone who's wrestling with their LGBT status um, uh, was confronted with that shirt and, and at the same time saw that the school didn't do anything, mm -hmm. that it could really have a negative impact and a negative psychological impact. It, it's such an interesting notion, this idea of balance, which I think is what, mm -hmm. when it, when anything gets to the Supreme Court level, it's almost always articulated as a balancing test of some kind. And so here's a student that is saying, I'm expressing my religion mm -hmm. and I'm expressing my disdain for, my religion's disdain for your lifestyle, as they mm -hmm. would call it. And the school is a sort of ambivalent. They don't know which student am I supposed to protect. And the court is saying it's about the impact on the other student, very much uh -huh. like sexual harassment uh -huh. law, which was a brand new notion uh -huh. that even if you said something nice, if I took it you know, as an oppressive kind of thing, uh -huh. that counted. So uh -huh. it seems like they've adopted, or in that case anyway, that the impact on the student, if it interferes with their ability to get an equal education, that counts. Mm -hmm. It Is does. And, and Judge Posner in a Chicago area case, uh, also a very well-known judge, well-known conservative judge in the Seventh Circuit, uh, ruled on a t-shirt that said, be happy, not gay. Mm. And he ruled that that was not, uh, that the student could wear that shirt. Hmm. And he developed, uh, he articulated a rule that is very interesting. Some are starting to call it the test score rule, that if a t-shirt or any article of clothing, uh, as an example, would interfere with the ability of students to do well on tests, then uh, it could be prohibited. And he determined that be happy, not gay, did not uh, go to that level, rightly or wrongly. Is that the same Posner that was the cheapest cost avoider of Posner? <laughs> what, that, what? Do you know that one? No. I believe it was. Judge Posner was um, a, a scholar, a published scholar before he was uh, a judge. And he had this theory that um, you should decide how much money should be spent on um, uh, taking care of things like pollution, for instance, through a theory called cheapest cost avoider. That is, if it costs you a lot of money to keep your car from polluting, but it only costs me a dollar to wear a mask, then everyone should be required to wear a mask because it was the cheapest cost avoider. I'm certain it was the same. Well, he's a law, big law and economics guy. Yes, and he's written exactly. a lot of, uh, lot of amazing books. So it's likely the same. So the person. test that he was talking about is, did it, did it hurt you when you're taking tests, not did it hurt your feelings? 
Although he did acknowledge, uh, to his credit, and as did the judge in the straight pride church, who also ruled uh, uh, that, that that shirt was not uh, w- could be worn, uh, both uh, opinions acknowledge that LGBT students do confront a lot of challenges uh, mm. at the K-12 level. Mm. And in fact, the the Minnesota judge was he was you know, said some of the most amazingly supportive things. Uh, on behalf of LGBT students, but then ruled that the straight pride shirt doesn't rise, doesn't rise to the level of disruption or potential disruption. So they're very interesting cases. If you put the Marilyn Manson shirt, the straight pride shirt, the homosexuality shameful shirt, and the, the happy not gay shirt together, it, it, some very fascinating discussions in my law school classes, needless <laughs> yes, to say. Yes, because they seem to go here and then there yes. and then here and then yes. there. Well, just you, drawing you, the line, as we say right. in the law, huh? You could argue that the more egregious shirts end up uh, 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 being prohibited and the less egregious are allowed. But then, you know, we talked about the straight pride shirt, and I, I'm set in class as an openly gay man, and the students uh, know it. Um, well, straight pride, that's arguably not that big a deal. And one of the openly gay students raises his hand and says, to me, it is a big deal. I would be very offended. So and, and isn't that the same as white pride? Hmm. Uh, well, maybe it is, and maybe it isn't. It's an interesting inquiry. Well, it's an in, it's a, always been a question of sort of who's in power, mm-hmm. because if you say black pride, people say, well, it's it's you're being told your whole life not to have pride, mm-hmm. and therefore this is sort of to combat that kind of message. Whereas mm-hmm. with white pride, it's more like saying, I'm on top, I'm in power right. anyway. And I'm proud of it. Right. And I guess this is the same sort of notion, but mm. the court didn't see it that the way. The court didn't see it that way. Right. Uh, in the LGBT class that I teach, which is mostly undergrads, uh, you have a range of views on, on that as well as to whether the straight pride shirt is, is offensive or not. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, it's very, to me, the most offensive uh, is homosexuality. is shameful because it goes right to the heart of what... Um, uh, I experienced and so many experience when you start thinking, well, maybe I'm gay, and then and you think, well, that's something I've been taught to be that's shameful, and that I should be I should be ashamed to even think that way, and my family would be ashamed, and mm-hmm. my friends would be ashamed, and my community would be ashamed. So you know, you, we're taught that in so many contexts even today, mm-hmm. and. Although the student who put that on his shirt might not have been thinking that, Mm -hmm. uh, the effect can be devastating. And and so to me, uh, that was the worst one. And Dale Carpenter, who's an openly gay law professor at Minnesota, a conservative man, um, when he was blogging about this case, uh, he said something that I thought of, what if you're uh, a young LGBT student um, male or female, and you're sitting in class, and right in front of you is the T-shirt. So it just happens you're sitting right in back of uh, Tyler Chase Harper, and the shirt that says homosexuality is shameful, hitting you right in the face, Mm -hmm. and nobody says anything, and you have to look at that or try to not look at that. Mm -hmm. Um, I thought that was a real poignant um, image on, Mm -hmm. on his part. Well, you know, that poignancy seems to be more of a national mood these days. I mean, lately there's been a lot more attention, unfortunately, because of the number of suicides of young people who uh, have this issue of shame or of being afraid of being found out. It's it's very mixed, of course, because... um... As you know, I worked on the book for seven years. It started Let's off talk as, about that book, okay. it, which just came out. First, we should know the title of the book, I think. The book is called The Right to Be Out, and that was the title of my law review article draft that, that morphed into a book. Uh-huh. And the subtitle is Sexual Orientation and Gender Identity in America's Public Schools. Uh-huh. Uh, the Right to Be Out is an interesting concept, because uh, you would think it it would be typically used, but um, you hear about coming out and being out, but uh, you rarely hear the term the right to be out, even though it's emerging under the law. So what do you mean by it? The right to be open about fundamental aspects of identity and personhood, 
which can include but uh, would not be limited to LGBT status. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the right to be treated equally as a result of that openness. So it's both the First Amendment right, the right to express and be open about a fundamental aspect of your identity and personhood, and a 14th Amendment right to, under the Equal Protection Clause to be treated equally as a result. Well, it's interesting because people have asked over the years, is this, I mean, it would be a First Amendment right because all I did was say that I was gay. Mm -hmm. And now I'm being punished for saying that. Mm -hmm. So it looks like a free speech issue mm -hmm. and the you know, the school is somehow punishing me, but what if the school just fails to protect me? Is that, is that sort of the same thing? Well, I think so. Uh, if it's protecting some and not others, mm -hmm. it's a, a, the area of education law that I think that arguably falls under is discriminatory discipline. Mm -hmm. um, and discriminatory discipline can be, uh, can take, many forms, but the, the two typical ones would be uh, if you respond differently to reports of mistreatment, depending on who's reporting them. And the second would be punishing people differently depending on uh, their actual or, per or perceived group affiliation. So what are the main aspects of your book? So the book has, uh, I would say it's probably two books in one. Mm -hmm. The first half is a book about the law and education in the area of LGBT issues in the public schools. And the second is about educational policy and how different ways that schools uh, have addressed and or might address uh, many of the intractable issues that uh, that, that still remains. What are the main uh, What are the main cases in the first section? We talked about the T-shirt cases, but what other kinds of cases have sort of set the law so far about LGBT? It's primarily students, but not only, and the and and the schools. So the four chapters of the first half are as a foundational chapter, which um, starts with cases that are not. L necessarily, not necessarily LGBT related, but uh, demonstrate how the First Amendment and the 14th Amendment intersect and how First Amendment cases have been strengthened uh, by adding in an equal protection component and mm -hmm. how equal protection clause cases have sometimes been strengthened by adding in a free speech component. And in addition, I bring in religion law Mm -hmm. uh, and show how, since religion is also part of the First Amendment, that that could add additional strength. Uh, and that's something that's not typically mentioned. Um, how, uh, how would it add additional strength? I, by strength, I assume you mean the ability to protect LGBT kids or those even perceived or thought to be LGBT at school. How, right. would, how would it strengthen it? Well, yeah, uh, the, the typical picture that people have in, in the in these discussions is that, well, the religious, the religion clauses are there for the religious hmm. and they're there for the religious, uh, even if the, the religious want to take an anti-gay position, which of course isn't always the case. Many people who are deeply religious and affiliated are not anti-gay. Right. Many are LGBT themselves. Uh, that's important to have said that, but the religion clauses are there for everyone, depending on, you know, are there for everyone no matter what uh, their sexual orientation or gender identity might be. So, for example, uh, say that uh, an LGBT educator uh, goes to uh, the Metropolitan Community Church or a Universal Unitarian Church or a branch of uh, Episcopalian church that is supportive of LGBTs and uh, views uh, himself or herself as, as a very proud, open member of uh, LGBT community and, and the religious community. Mm -hmm. And 
uh, wants to be open about that. Mm -hmm. And so if students ask him or her, you know, where do you go to church? They're, well, I go to uh, 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 BCC, which is an LGBT uh, synagogue mm -hmm. uh, in LA. Uh, school officials might be very uncomfortable with, with the teachers saying that, but you could argue that just, just as the straight teacher down the hall is allowed to say, well, I go to um, the, this, uh, this particular church um, in, in my community and, and you know, that, that may have nothing to do with LGBT. Mm -hmm. or, mm -hmm. um, so that's one example where the freedom of religion uh, intertwined with freedom of expression in a way that includes both. And another, uh, just briefly, would be if a school um, tries to um, make decisions relating to LGBT youth or LGBT um, educators or both based on religious doctrine. Mm -hmm. You're not allowed in the public sector uh, to do that. So, you know, the, there are many instances, uh, although not as, they're not articulated in this way in this era, but still today, many school policy decisions are based on uh, the, the religious, inter the, a particular religious interpretation of, of scriptures that, um, that is anti-gay. So the first chapter is foundational, right? and then what? So then there is a specific uh, chapter on LGBT youth, and then a specific chapter on LGBT educators, and then uh, a chapter on curriculum, religion, morality, and values. Well, that sounds like it. And there are cases that involve and, curriculum and values in education. What, For example, what would a case involving curriculum be or have been? So uh, the, the two major cases um, uh, involving uh, curriculum and education are probably the Moser versus Hawkins County Board of Ed case out of the Bible Belt in the 1980s, a Tennessee case, and Parker v. Hurley, which is out of the First Circuit in uh, Massachusetts, uh, in 08, which, which uh, was famously or infamously uh, distorted or referenced, depending on your point of view, in uh, one of the most famous Yes on Aid ads. Uh, should we talk about both or should we zero in on Parker v. Hurley? Or? Well, let's start with that, Only, uh, although it's a national show, and so we're not only talking about Prop 8, but I think the notion of the um, the misuse of a court case in these uh, anti-gay marriage ads in California is, uh, is interesting. Mm -hmm. What did they do? What was the holding and then what did they distort? So Parker v. Hurley uh, was about, was, was two parents who complained. Um, in one case, uh, they were both uh, parents of, of young people uh, in the primary grades and the Massachusetts public schools. And in one case, the, the, the boy was given a package of, of materials, diversity related materials. And one of them had a picture of, among, in the package was a picture of, uh, he wasn't the only one, all the students were given mm -hmm. such a package. And there were a couple of pictures of all different families, mm -hmm. uh, including uh, a family, uh, at least one family, uh, that had um, uh, two gay uh, parents. Mm -hmm. uh, in the other case, there was a um, uh, the teacher read the book King and King uh, out loud uh, mm -hmm. in class. And so the parents challenged this uh, as a violation of their constitutional rights to direct the upbringing of their children under the 14th Amendment and also as a violation of their free exercise. Their right? own free exercise their own of religion. Free exercise uh -huh. rights. So um, the ruling went against the parents. In uh, both of the cases? In, and as it did in the Bible Belt case uh, um, 20 years earlier, and as it typically uh, is the case in, uh, in sex ed related cases, uh -huh. um, 
courts have been, federal courts have been consistent across the country um, in ruling that parents uh, don't get to come in and, and uh, challenge the curriculum, that they have the opportunity by uh, electing school board members and electing governors who might appoint state boards of education. They have a say in what goes on. And also it would be intensely chaotic. Uh, if every set of parents was directing the curriculum uh, in a different way. I mean, it, it would be impossible to have any kind of a unified mm -hmm. curriculum at all. Mm -hmm. uh, so it seems rational, but you said that the proponents of Proposition 8 in California misused this opinion. Uh, and a, a, a very similar version of the same ad with the same reference happened in Maine mm -hmm. uh, and was used to, to help defeat, to help, uh, to, to help uh, that proposition pass, which uh, banned the legalization of, of gay marriage in Maine. So what did they say in the ad about this case? So uh, the case start the, the ad starts off where where a young girl is coming up and goes, mommy mommy guess what I learned in school today what sweetie I learned that uh, uh, boys can marry a boy and I can marry a princess and the mother looks horrified and I think that they um, I think she had king and king in her hand mm -hmm. and then a professor from Pepperdine Law School uh, comes on and says think it can't happen it's already happened. Mm. And he goes on to say, when Massachusetts legalized gay marriage, kids were taught blah, blah, blah. Well, uh, this if you look at the uh, Massachusetts curriculum um, of which this was a part, it was developed and implemented before gay marriage was legalized in Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. And books such as Heather Has Two Mommies uh, have been appearing on the shelves. Uh, as you know, quite a while before uh, Massachusetts legalized gay marriage. So to say that it was because of Massachusetts legalizing gay marriage and that it would happen here if we legalized or kept gay marriage legal and it would happen in Maine is a distortion. Well, their whole, excuse me for my opinion, but the whole proponents uh, set of ads was a distortion because they were saying you will be, because you uh, all students must learn about marriage in California. If you have gay marriage, then they're going to be forced to learn about gay marriage. Well, the first premise was completely false. There's nothing in California law that says they have to teach about marriage. And therefore, and they don't. I mean, if you could ask ask your own kids, you know, how much teaching do they get about marriage in school? They referenced, the, they actually, the second distortion, there were three distortions, also, so that was the first. The second distortion is they actually showed uh, an excerpt from Senate Bill 71, which you authored, mm -hmm. uh, which is the section where uh, you can have comprehensive sex education if you want to, you don't have to, but if you do, you have to teach respect for marriage and committed relationships. And they highlight the word marriage mm -hmm. ostensibly as evidence that you have to teach about Yes, that was one of those amendments that I had to agree to so I the know. Blue Dog Democrats would vote for a reasonable sex ed bill in California right. and see how it comes back and bites you when you're reasonable and agreeable. And then the, <laughs> that's true. And then the third, <clears throat> sorry, the third distortion is perhaps the worst, in my opinion, uh, where it, the professor actually says, that the court ruled that parents had no legal right to object. Those are his exact terms. And then you see in big letters, no right to object. Mm -hmm. Well, the court never used that language. The court never said that the parents have no right to object. It actually said at the end of the opinion that if parents are not happy with curriculum or instructional materials, they have an avenue to go ahead and change their school board. Uh, they have total right to ob object, and uh, and yet uh, they're saying this in the ad so that parents think, well, we, we don't uh, vote yes on Prop 8, uh, our rights will be abrogated in a big way. And I actually saw news reports that, 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 that stated that at yes on 8 ads in the last few weeks in 
California, parents were holding up signs, parental rights, yes on parental rights, yes on Prop 8, to a great extent linked to the sad when Prop 8 had nothing to do at all. Well, their polling rights. showed them that people did not actually oppose gay marriage, that it was sort of like whatever people, if they want to get married, that seems more stable to me. It seems mm -hmm. like a good thing. So in order to pass the proposition and pass mm -hmm. the ban on gay marriage, or marriage equality, uh -huh. they had to make it be about children. And that has been very interesting. You know, when uh -huh. I first brought the bill to protect students in school against discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation or even uh -huh. perceived whether it was uh -huh. not actual, um, I mean, my, members who voted for the bill were hung in effigy outside their offices. Uh -huh. There was incredible feeling and passion uh, weeping and the gnashing of teeth uh -huh. by parents about how horrible it would be. And this was to pr protect children against discrimination, how horrible that would be for the entire system uh -huh. of education. So uh -huh. it seems like your book is a breath of fresh air and some common sense. Well, thank you, Sheila. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. Now, you said the second part was really about policy. Right. How is that different from the law? So policy is what schools, um, it, one way of describing or defining policy for purposes of this book is uh, to see it as about what schools and school districts and uh, boards of education at the local and state level decide should be done on a day-to-day -day level. Policies have the force of law, of course. They are driven by the law but uh, it, it's, it tends to be more, okay, so we have these legal requirements. What are we gonna do um, for our science lesson tomorrow or mm -hmm. for our history unit this month? Um, uh, curricular policy is an example of that. Um, it's, not, it's not the only example. So let me ask you, Stuart, with just five minutes remaining actually in the show, how quickly it goes when you're having wow. a good time. That I know was it is quick. fast, isn't it? Um, in the big picture, this has been a, and become even more a significant part of your life. Um, why, why do this? I mean, it's personal, but also you're, you're working to protect an awful lot of young people. Um, wh why does, what drives you to do this? As I think I told you, I, when I did finally break through and, and come out first to myself and then, then to the world, uh, I looked around and there I was at UCLA. Uh, people saw me as an expert in education and law. I was training future principals. I had trained many future teachers. I was training future lawyers. I was teaching about technology and privacy law issues and disability rights as well. And I was thinking, wow, uh, LGBT issues fits right in and there's a lot of work to be done. So it was a natural uh, thing to do. I didn't have to seek out a new job. I didn't have to get a whole lot of permission. I got permission to start a new course on LGBT issues in, in education, the first one ever in the education school, but mostly it was about just recrafting my courses and, and starting to write about something that I was very passionate about. And it just kept being reinforced by colleagues and friends and the community. And I was also monitoring the public schools in San Francisco and they, um, the people in the Bay Area had a tremendous impact on, on my work as well. And uh, so it's been very gratifying. And, and of course, events keep showing that, that there's more work to be done. And do you think that, do you think we will improve in our schools around these issues? Well, I'm the perennial optimist. Uh, I tell my students when I, when I stop being an optimist, I'm gonna stop teaching in this area. So I'm the perennial optimist. We have improved in a lot of ways. And, and of course your legislation in California played a big part in that. But we, ha we, still, we still have a ways to go, there's no question. Stuart, thank you so much for being on the show. I really, really appreciate it. Thank you, sir. And I appreciate your work, too. And say the name of the book one more time, because I know everyone will want to go buy it. The book's called The Right to Be Out, uh, Sexual Orientation and Gender Identity in America's Public Schools. So that's the issue. 
It's about our schools. It's about equality. Glad that you joined us today. And as to protecting all our students in the schools, get used to it. Thank <clears throat> you.